Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice at Retzel and Andrus. Today, I'm joined by Brian Nelson and Dina Rutkowski. Did I say it right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, from Ebix. Um, which is a billing company that I've worked with for a very long time, not only for billing services, uh, but for excellent education and auditing. And I'm really excited that they're able to join us today because what I want to talk about is what healthcare providers should be looking for when they're hiring a billing service to work with them, uh, what they need to avoid, and um, you know, just generally some insight that people may not realize that just because somebody calls themselves the billing company doesn't mean they are one that you should be using. Um, so welcome, Dina and Brian. Thanks so much for being here. Now, I have worked with you guys for a long time, and I know you work with a lot of my clients, and I know that your services run the full range. Um, let me tell you a, just a little bit about uh, Brian. He has more than 30 years of experience in healthcare reimbursement, and he's considered a leader in revenue cycle uh, management. He really runs a company that is kind of focused on education, training, and engagement, and uh, the team members have that same insight as well. Dina, who I work with quite often, is a leading expert in uh, revenue cycle management. Uh, she's a certified professional coder, certified evaluation um, and management specialist, a certified compliance professional. Um, she works with many specialties and actually teaches and has certainly uh, taught me a lot about this as well. So um, just a little bit of background so everybody knows that you know exactly what you're talking about. So let's get started. Brian, why don't we just start with you? Um, tell us a little bit about Ebix. What makes your company uh, different from other companies? And just generally, since people all around the country uh, are listening to this, when you're looking to hire a billing company, what should you be looking for? Well, you, you, you hit me right off the bat when you said 30 plus years of experience at that point. Lots of time <laughs> flying at this point here. So Erica, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Evix, we are a 47-year-old regional revenue cycle management firm. Uh, why is that important? You kind of talked about that previously. There's a lot of billing companies that do the tactical sending out claims, things of that nature, collect money. But what really helps the providers maximize their dollars are kind of the consultative educational components that organizations, mid-sized organizations such as ours provide. You have to keep up with the industry trends. What's um, payable? What's not payable? What can I do to maximize my dollars, be it coding, be it data analytics, things of that nature that providers should be looking for as they move forward. Okay, so uh, we want to make sure that the billing services obviously are the best. And in terms of keeping updated, um, you know, I know that's something that Dina gets very involved with. Um, but before we talk about that, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what you are experiencing. Do you find like your um, your clients are up to date on what HIPAA requires and, um, you know, what the security requirements are? A lot of clients, when they sign a billing agreement, they don't even ask about that. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on that. Sure. <laughs> it all depends upon the complexity and the size of the client, Erica. Great question, because you have provider groups that are one to two providers as large as 30, 40, 50 providers. And there's a wide degree of education and sophistication that they possess. When a group is looking at outsourcing, they should look at what type of resources can an organization provide to them in that <clears throat> compliance component. Are they doing any type of baseline auditing to have a paper trail ongoing educational component, things of that nature? Do they have questions? Do they have resources when they have questions? Can they call the organization and say, hey, this doesn't sound right, or how do I do that? Can you give me some guidance on that? We will certainly do that. Organizations of our size and scope will do that. If not, we reach out to professionals such as yourself for that definitive answer. But we're looking at that as coming being a trusted advisor to keep them on the narrow and straight and once again, maximize their dollars. 
Okay, great. So in terms of compliance, I know that's a really big issue for you. Everything from making sure that you're maintaining records uh, in the compliant manner based on state and federal law. And we've been hearing a lot about cybersecurity uh, and a breach uh, that recently happened uh, with United Healthcare. And this is really monumental because it has affected a lot of uh, healthcare practices around the country as well as other related providers. What are you hearing from your clients about this if you anything you want to kick that one, one off that's more in your world yeah um we've had thank you thank you erica um we've had a lot of clients called concern about one did we use change healthcare as a clearinghouse which we do not however there are a lot of entities that do and some of the things that are concerns is some of the payers that um, our providers are credentialed with use change healthcare to cut their checks, do their EFTs, process all their claims. And right now, a lot of that is on hold. And you can't even get to the information within their systems at this point to even get a claim status on anything that's going on. I think the bigger issue that we don't know about with some of those um, clearing houses or entities or vendors that some of um, our insurance companies use as they may not even use change healthcare, but they use another vendor that goes through change healthcare, which is also going to stall or halt some of that processing. So um, at this point, there's still a lot to learn. We know that this particular cyber attack is um, a similar threat to what we're used to seeing with other cyber attacks, but it's very different in the fact that it is affected the overall US healthcare ecosystem. And so that's very different. Um, so we don't know enough yet. There's still a lot to come out and there's still a, not, a lot that's not being said. So we're reading and looking at information every day. But the clear fact is, is as soon as you can change away from using change healthcare, you can go directly on like Ability or some of those other websites and file your claims if you happen to be using that with your organization um, and start filing your claims a different way. And that's what we would recommend as soon as possible. And thousands of organizations are having to do that because there's going to be small clinics or doctor's offices or provider offices that are really going to be affected by their cash flow. So anything you can do to get out of that quickly is what we would recommend. You know, can I jump on that? Erica, we've had we've had calls in the past couple of weeks that are non-clients asking for help. What do we do? We're a smaller organization. We do things internally. We don't know where to go, what to do, things of that nature. So there's a a lot of unknown at this point. And as Dina said, a lot of the smaller organizations are really struggling financially because of that. So are there, what we try to do, and I think organizations our size, try to keep pushing information out to the clients, keep them abreast of what's going on. They have to make business decisions on that. Cash flow is going to be challenging at this point. So just kind of keeping them abreast as much as we can at this point. Right. And, you know, cyber attacks are something that are happening more and more. So I've covered this topic before, but practices really need to make sure that they have insurance uh, that would affect a cyber attack or business continuation or interruption type coverage. Um, however, this is the kind of thing that even a billing, a billing company, it didn't happen to a billing company. It happened to, uh, you know, a different organization, but it uh, has a lot of uh, downstream impact. So, uh that being said, every organization still needs to make sure that they have precautions in place to protect uh, a more localized attack, right? Uh, yeah. Which can be just as harmful, if not more. Um, so aside from the things we can't control, which cyber attacks, um, you know, of other parties are, are one of them. What can we control? And so, Dina, you and I have worked very often on clients who are getting audited, and you've been a great resource for that. What can you say about, you know, as a billing company, the kind of services that you're offering or that billing companies should be offering to clients uh, to avoid those audits in the first place, uh, and any trends that you're seeing in that area that might be helpful? Um, uh, some of the things that we offer our clients are edu just minimum education, right? At the end of the year, um, we have certified coders that work with our organization. And so we do a lot of monthly and weekly education, going to local webinars and learning the newest coding changes, anything that might be affecting any of our clients. Um, we also practice um, 
educating ourselves on specialties we might not currently be with because you never know if you are. So you just want to make sure that you're abreast to anything that changes that are out there. But we do give our clients updates at the end of the year. We let them know what's changing in their pers pers perspective specialty, things like that. Uh, we do documentation audits. We'll read their records. Um, and based on the code that they bill, we can give them feedback on what it should have been. Are they leaving money on the table? Are there things they didn't bill for? Um, where time needs to be an element? Are they actually documenting time clearly? Those kind of things that are extremely important. Um, insurance companies deny claims so much more than they ever did before. I mean, so does your documentation include a patient identifier on every page when you send it in the insurance company? If you're missing that small little key and it doesn't come out of every EMR, your insurance company is going to deny that claim because the record cannot support who the patient is on every page. That's the biggest thing that we've seen right now, especially from the Medicare and um, some of the other payers that follow their footsteps. Um, it's been pretty much of a huge surprise to certain payers where they're losing big dollars because of that. So I recommend that they check their EMRs, print out those records and make sure they're checking that before they send it in on appeal or anything like that. Um, we also do, um, you know, just random audits on our own coders. You know, how, how are they doing? Are they, you know, we anybody can get in a lazy habit, right? So we want to just make sure everyone is staying on their A game. And we do that not only with our coding department, we do that in our follow-up end with the resolution work. Are, is our staff taking the right steps on the front end with the demographics? Are we verifying through certain portals that the insurance is appropriate? Just trying to do anything you can to not delay a claim. Um, because there's so many reasons claims get denied these days. Um, so those are some of the big things. I'd like to jump in on what Dina just said, part of that provider education. We just had a meeting with one of our seasoned providers, and we're talking about his charges and encounters, things of that nature, and we kind of asked a little bit more about the coding, things of nature, and went, I think I'm undervaluing my services. I've been doing this for 20, 25 years, and I can do this in my sleep. So we started looking at his coding and his documentation, and we did a review for him. And sure enough, he was leaving money on the table. So for the group that you're working with, how do you make sure that you, you are capturing everything that you are doing? Dina started talking about denials are greater and more robust than they've ever been. So you, you're looking for an organization that can kind of help spot check those type of trends for your clients at that point too. We walked out of the meeting going, okay, I own this. I've got to re rechange my thinking here and go back to that. Yeah, I do think just to kind of comment off that too, I do believe that when you do something every day, it's some, it, it does seem to become simplistic and you're still, you still have to go through the same thought process. You still need to apply, you know, your decision-making and analyze what's really going on with that patient. So even if you've done it every day, it doesn't change the, um, the acuity of what you're treating. And so I do think it's important to make sure that they're documented. I've read a lot of notes where I'm like, I know this provider had to have done this to come to this conclusion, and it's nowhere in their notes. So making sure it only takes a few sentences to add some of the right things to get a level of service that's appropriate for the acuity of the patient that you're treating. And it's very nice now that all the ENM uh, guidelines have changed, you know, where a three used to, you know, you had... Uh, where you used to have a three, a three is almost always a four now, where you used to have a five, a five is many times a four now. So many visits fall into the level four range. And I don't think a lot of providers know that. And I think it's important for them to understand those regulations. And you do not have to just bill by time because you can get it very easily by documentation alone. Wow, that's great to know. So, I mean, it's really interesting listening to you because I think a lot of people either do their own billing or use just, uh, you know, somebody who's decided to start a billing company that really doesn't have this expertise. So in addition to perhaps not even being aware of changes or capturing all that income, um, I find at least, and you can tell me if you agree, that um, these are the type of practices that we tend to get a lot of audit letters on. And, uh, you know, we send them to you, you review a sample and, and every usually every single one of them has done something wrong, something that they should have known if they were, uh, you know, a certified coder or um, or something like that. Are you seeing any particular trends in terms of the type of um, 
you know, audits that are going on, particular specialties, or I, I know you mentioned uh, having the the uh, the page notated by particular uh, codes at all. Sometimes we see trends, sometimes we don't. Are you seeing anything right now? Let me jump in on a high level because we are just involved in a component of this. A prenatal care, when it's a governmental reimbursement, that specialty, and you talk about specialty, is really under the scrutiny at this point. There is a, there's been a lot of fraud involved with that and things of that nature. So we're seeing more on a pure governmental Medicaid, Medicare component where they're putting a lot of that uh, hot level look at that point, things of that nature. So within the past three to five months, we've had to work and or testify and or work with the organizations because of that. So it's a smaller niche, but all of a sudden the government is really putting a lot of emphasis on that. Mm. Now, Dina, on your end, what are you, what are you seeing or are I, you seeing? I don't think that any specialty is um, a, a void of having their medical records requested. I'm, I'm where we get so many medical record requests that I'm at the mind right now that eventually not far off insurance companies are not going to pay anything unless they see the medical record first. So how do we make sure from the office perspective and from the clinical documentation perspective that everything that is required is in that record so you don't have to fight it two and three times. I mean, we still have the Unite Health Cares of the world and the Anthems of the world that love to request a million more records than are needed and deny a bunch of claims inadvertently and you're appealing it and reconsidering it and doing all these things in order to get paid. Um, I think documentation is huge and no specialty is going to be able to avoid that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. wow. Great. So one of the things I also want to touch upon is if if you, uh, meaning one of our listeners, does get a letter, uh, an audit letter from the federal government or one of their uh, agencies or uh, even a private carrier, um, what steps are you recommending um, that you know, they should follow. From my perspective, they should always go through counsel to make sure that their next steps are protected by attorney-client privilege. But what is your recommendation uh, in terms of responding to an audit? Well, I'm going to jump in initially, and you stole my answer. First thing is when you talk to counsel, and, and you put that out there, so you kind of have that what, where are we in the whole lay of that land, okay? How difficult, how challenging is this going to be? And then from there, Erica, I guess Dina can talk about next steps, but I'm looking at how, how do you perform a CYA initially? Because if you don't have your support, things can go sideways pretty, pretty quickly at that point. Dina, maybe you can jump in on yeah. what happens after we receive that. You know, there's certain things that we just don't know because medical records are requested so often uh, that they may just be accumulating information before they're going to reach out to the client with a huge finding, so to speak. So on those individual medical record requests, I think it's difficult for a provider to reach out to their counsel, even though that's what we would want them to do. So how do they proactively get their records reviewed get their, you know, just some random review of, am I going to be okay if I send these records in before okay. there's this big can of worms that opens up and now I'm really in a lot of trouble. So I think being proactive is the biggest thing to do because they're requested all the time. Over a year, you could have a couple hundred records requested and you would never know that they're accumulating something against you at that point. So how can you be okay. proactive? I recommend that highly. And right. maybe my last thing, when it does happen, if something happens, don't ignore it. We've had providers that have had requests or things of that nature, and they've just chosen to put that off to the side. And all of a sudden you have a mountain versus a molehill, and you probably could have been proactive with your communication and discussions. And take that to heart anytime there are not the not the simplistic denials Dina's talking about when you have those more formal letters and they're talking about recoupments and or fines and penalties, right. take that to heart. Right. And that's exactly kind of what I was thinking. Like, obviously, you get record requests continuously um, and people do need to be proactive. They should be doing annual audits. They should have a compliance plan in place. When you do get a significant 
record requests. And sometimes they tell you what they're looking for. Sometimes they don't. You know, what we do when we reach out to you typically is to get a sample of letter, a uh, sample of records reviewed. And I assume that this is the approach that you like to take. Um, so first reach out to counsel, then uh, through counsel, reach out to someone like Dina. Dina reviews a sampling of the records and kind of gives a report back. By having somebody like Dina tell us at least ahead of time what she sees wrong in the records, uh, that gives us uh, a head up. We, uh, we can go back and fix certain records depending on the time that's passed. Maybe it's reimbursing money, uh, billing something correctly that was, you know, incorrectly billed. But obviously, we can only go back so far. Uh, mm -hmm. But at least knowing ahead of time what is out there gives us a little bit of knowledge. There's nothing worse than sending records in. You have no idea what they're looking for. And then when you find out, you're like, oh, God, you know, how did I not know yeah. that? So that's kind of what I'm wanting to recommend. What do you think? Yeah. No, I agree with that too. I mean, and there's two sides to that because one, yes, they need the counsel. And I do feel that those annual audits and things are great. However, you may also find that they're really undervaluing what they're doing. So there's a, there's two, per, you know, there's multiple purposes for why you would want to make sure you do that up front. Um, but counsel is the best. I think that that's the only way to really protect your interest and um, be able to move forward in a positive and compliant yeah direction. Right. Okay. And obviously I care about compliance more because yeah. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if they did do something inappropriate, you're able to speak on that behalf, put corrective measures and hopefully negotiate on behalf of the client and mea culpa, mea culpa. And how can we do things better moving forward and, and kind of move that aspect? So right. nor bring the resources in that you need to help your organization at that time. Right. And I think, you know, Dina, we've worked with you, we've refunded money, we have, uh, you know, uh, had to deal with other government actions taken against the client. So uh, the results of the audits that are done when a serious inquiry is made, uh, it's really important. We want to keep that confidential uh, while we figure out what we want to do. And then, you know, you've been an important part of uh, our team in terms of responding to those. Now, you work not only with your clients when it comes to doing audits, uh, but you also uh, can help those who didn't know they needed you uh, when yeah. they're in a tough spot spot as well. And, and I think that's really important for people to know that, you know, mm -hmm. if you realize that perhaps what you've been doing is inadequate, uh, think about making a change. But before you do anything, get some help. And uh, and the other thing I want to mention is the time uh, for responding, because mm -hmm. you can have all the best intention, but if you miss deadlines, you sometimes give up some of your rights as well. So um, that's one of the reasons that you got to kind of move quickly. If you haven't been doing preventative things and and you suddenly hear from someone who is looking into things, uh, then you got to move pretty quickly. I, you know, I know doctors are busy, but I think uh, the expense and the time to respond to these is much less than the expense and the time you'll have to spend if you don't properly respond. Absolutely. Yeah. To yeah. my point, don't ignore it. It's something no one wants to deal with, but reach out to your resources as soon as you have that and lay that strategy as quick as you can. Yeah, and and we're we're very good at helping clients with that, even people that are practices that aren't even part of ours. We've actually represented them in front of insurance companies previously. Insurance companies are, you know, coming with those audit requests and they're inappropriate. Many times the the documentation is there, but the the normal some normal staff doesn't realize, you know, the documentation guidelines well enough to be able to say no, this is wrong. Okay, this is this was okay back in 1995. It's not okay to do that to us today in 2023 or 24. So those are things that um, are really important to be able to understand as well. Um, another reason to have your counsel before you to protect you in, in something like that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The rules are changing. So just because something's a rule now doesn't mean it was, you know, mm -hmm. during the time period. Now, I heard something recently about reimbursement for pre-authorizations. Um, is that something that is being talked about or has it gone into effect? Well, there... I don't know if pre-authorization, so to speak, is what it is, but there's something called the No Surprises Act. So if you're non-participating with an, an 
with an insurance company, the patient has a right to understand what that cost is going to be prior to that service. So maybe that relates to that prior authorization talk. You need a prior authorization, and then you want to know because if you're if you're participating, um, it doesn't really make a difference. But there's patients who will complain that right. go on a network and then they get surprised with this bill, and it probably does relate a little bit to that to some extent. Right. I think. Yeah. No, I I think it was something else I'm thinking of, but that's a great point. And we've actually done a podcast recently on that as well, um, on the No Surprises Act and making sure patients are aware of what you're billing. So you guys can uh, check that out as well. Um, all right. Any final thoughts that you want to share with everyone? No, I think at this point, use a group effort. Uh, use your, your accountants, use your revenue cycle management firm, use your legal resources. Yeah, if you have questions, don't be afraid to use consultative resources at your disposal. Things are becoming more complicated and complex than they were years ago. And I see that moving even, even to a larger complexity. So mm -hmm. use That's the great. resources available to you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have final that. thoughts? Yeah, no, I completely agree with them. I completely agree with everything that you just said. I don't usually awesome. do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, and this is recorded. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> so Dina and Brian, thank you so much. Um, we will include your information when we post this. Um, you know, Ebix has been a really valued partner of mine uh, for so many years now. God, I don't even want to say know, how many years. Like, uh, a long time. And um, I'm so glad you could be here today. And if we, you know, get some follow-up questions, uh, maybe we'll do another podcast down the road. And thanks so much for joining me. Erica, right, wonderful to you. see you. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yes, thanks for having us. Best of luck. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. This has been the Health Law Hotspot. You can check out our other topics at ralaw.com. I'm Erica Adler, and I'll see you next time. Thanks. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.